it came with surprises sometimes, including you'd think that infrastructure um, is, you know, reasonably reputationally easy um, as compared to, let's say, you know, buying a, a commercial operating company. And I'll tell you, we got some surprises. Uh, I'll tell you, and I, I say this is only half jokingly, who knew uh, that there's a large movement in the world about free water? There happens to be a large movement in the world about free water. And we went and bought a water utility in the UK. Um, and I suddenly found myself with protesters um, and people jamming my inbox who thought that it was unreasonable to charge um, for a utility to charge users for water because there's some, so you have to be ready for that kind of, like there's nowhere to hide, right? You own the water company, you're on the board, it's your investment, there's nowhere to hide. So you've got to be prepared for some of those externalities uh, as well and be prepared to take them on uh, as an organization. So to me, making that decision, um, and, and, and Kalsters, is, as you say, has already made some of that decision, right? In terms of, of public markets, where you have scale, you can build the operating, ca uh, the operating capabilities, you've decided that it makes sense uh, to internalize the management of a lot of your, your public market investing. Um, and the question is, how do you go through that analysis on a, on a case by case basis? Looking at the costs and benefits and try not to forget, um, as we did on occasion, uh, some of the non-financial costs um, that also come with internalizing uh, those, uh, those programs. So 160 million a year is a very compelling figure. Um, it'll be interesting <coughs> to hear the board reflect on that when it, when it comes to them. That, that's uh, powerful. And my guess is you only had to generate lower gross return because the, you didn't have to generate the same returns to get a higher net. You, you didn't have to. Our experience was that we, we, were, we, we were able to generate returns actually that were a little bit higher than the market yeah. um, based on our own studies. But uh, that's correct because you can lose out a little bit and still, and still come out ahead. But again, you have intangible costs mm. uh, associated as well. Let me just give you one other figure before I pass it on to Jonathan mm. maybe to, to answer the same question. Um, the internal cost of running the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board is over a billion dollars a year. That's the internal budget that does nothing to do with pension management, nothing to do with pension administration. That's the investment team, a billion dollars a year of, of internal cost. So you've got to be really, really comfortable when you're going to spend a billion dollars a year. And by the way, 70% of that cost is compensation. Um, you've got to be really, really comfortable if you're going to spend that, that you're going to get the outcomes, um, the better net outcomes uh, to the beneficiaries. So these are these are big important choices. They're not they're not small decisions. Jonathan, my my question for you, and, this, and then we'll turn it over to the board, is a little different. Your role at OTPP is really um, redesigning the organization and positioning your organization for the future. When we look around at the world today, we see technology doing things that maybe none of us expected it would. Drones flying around, driving car, self driving cars. Um, it's incredibly difficult for me to look out 10 years and know what the real operating model is of an institutional investment organization. Will we have self-driving portfolios? That seems obvious to me. Will we be matchmaking on deal flow and cutting out investment banks in the same way that we meet our spouses and online platforms? Uh, that seems obvious to me. So when you're looking at a billion dollar organization spread across multiple countries, that to me feels like an inflexible Titanic style um, organization that could be completely dislocated through a technical technological innovation that's going to hit in five years. Shouldn't we just be building incredibly flexible organizations right now? Well, um, maybe just for the benefit of the board, I can I can describe what it is that I'm trying to do and, and the, the department that I run at Ontario Teachers because I think it, it's, um, it's important uh, context. So in um, the beginning of last year, um, our senior leadership created a department called Global Strategic Relationships, of which I'm the head. And the notion here is that we need to, uh, in an era of some uncertainty and change, just as you're alluding to, uh, we need to be more flexible and we need to focus on longer term relationships for the purpose of 
increasing the information that we have about what uh, is occurring in the world, and second, uh, for a differentiated deal flow, which doesn't necessarily, as I alluded to earlier, doesn't necessarily come from the traditional sources. But on top of that, one of the key things is that organizations like ours have generally grown up along silos of activity. And those silos can limit our capacity to um, address asset class convergence, which is taking place even as we speak, between asset classes that were hitherto viewed as being very different or sectors that were viewed as being very different, but actually are beginning to converge together. So you need a nexus internally in your organization so that you can actually interact in a way where you can jump on those opportunities and not be really getting stuck um, looking at things in a very linear way. So that's what we're trying to do. In terms of the question of the model that we have as an investment fund, I do think that there is a great need to build in as much resilience as one can. Resilience today is about uh, technical discussion around portfolio construction, and that has been something we've been very focused on for the last few years, to create a portfolio that has a greater all-weather kind of uh, feature so that we are more comfortable that if things don't outplay the way we think, that the fiduciaries will be protected. That's a very technical but extremely important part of resilience. But there's another kind of resilience, which is our operating resilience. Sort of the, the ability for us to adjust, the ability for us to make modifications based on good information. Closed systems that are based on very rigid um, structures tend not to be very good at adjusting to new uh, circumstances. There's, <laughs> there's a biological um, analogy here. The most successful um, uh, species are those that are able to adapt quickly and take in lots of information about what's going on and being able to adapt. Ones that don't do that, like dinosaurs, for example, which is the, the ultimate um, analogy, don't do so well with the change of temperature of 0.8%. So what we're trying to do is to create a more resilient organization, and we think that the key currency of that resilience is information. Information is the thing that will either bury us or save us in this era. And we want to be on the saving side, not on the burying side. And how do you do that? It's by engaging in ways that we tend not to think were necessary before. If you were the head of um, emerging market credit, which I was at one time, uh, at Ontario Teachers, you talk to people in emerging market credit and you talk to the banks and you're in your little world and everything is great. The problem is what happens if the best opportunities are in emerging market infrastructure or equity. And if you're only focused on credit, corporate credit, then you can get lost. So I think that the creating a much greater ability to take in information, but take in information that is not generic to your particular silo, but to take in information that is relevant to the overall organization, a total fund view of what's happening in emerging markets, a far more resilient approach. And that's actually, I think, how we will be um, uh, better equipped, we hope, uh, to deal with big, big shifts that I think are absolutely in the offing. I think we're going to turn oh, it over to yeah. uh, the committee now. Thank yep. you uh, to the three of you for your very thought-provoking comments and uh, sharing yeah, your experiences. Uh, so we'll start with Ms. Hendricks. So, um, Mr. Weissman, I wanted to go back to when you were talking through comparative advantages for Ontario teachers and wondering if you can... Can you walk us through what you think our comparative advantages are at CalSTRS? Because I, I took note of some of the things you said, which we have in common, but some we don't. And I'm curious if Chris might have opinions or want to opine on that. So that's one question. And the second one is, is one that I feel like comes up every time I talk to my Canadian colleagues, because we tend to hang out quite a bit. And I really appreciate so much of the work you do. But again, we have constraints in California, politics, all sorts of different pieces that impact, you know, some of the conversation you're talking about with cost savings, which I get excited about <coughs> internal management, and yet we have constraints, obviously. And so I just wonder if you have any thoughts um, for us um, as trustees on this board um, with our staff. We have a lot of confidence in our staff, and we... Um, would, would love to be able to do some of the things you're suggesting. Obviously, we have different constraints and challenges, so I wonder if you can just discuss, both of you discuss that, so. Sure. First of all, on the comparative advantage question, you know, I think it is very, um, it, it's, it's, 
you know, far be it from me from the outside uh, to, okay. to come and, and, and say that I understand um, what Calster's, uh, you know, comparative advantages are. I mean, some of them are, are fairly obvious, I think. Um, scale. You know, scale is one uh, that we would, would share in, in common uh, with the Canada Pension Plan. Um, I think time horizon is one um, that uh, is likely in, in, in common. Um, there's others, though, that you should, I think, consider and, and explore. Um, you know, Ashby talked about some of the advantages that UC Regents has by where you're located. Um, I would suggest that, that Calsters probably has some locational advantages um, in terms of access to technology and access to investment to where you sit. Uh, you also have some advantages uh, in terms of geography, in terms of attracting talent. Um, you know, we had, you may think of Sacramento as being a disadvantage, uh, but you're within uh, California, you're within the United States. And I can tell you that um, our ability to attract and retain talent uh, geographically, particularly if you're trying to recruit somebody to come to Toronto in February, um, um, is, is, is hard. Uh, and so one of the things we had to think about was actually opening offices uh, um, outside of Canada um, to get the type of talent that we, we needed. So there's, it's, it's, I think some of them you share, some of them you have that will be, uh, that you'll have advantages that some of the Canadian plans uh, don't have. Um, and, and other things, for example, the, gov the, the governance structure um, will be a disadvantage, comparatively speaking. Um, the fact that you uh, are constrained, and this is not to make a, uh, a pejorative, it's just a fact. It's not to say one's better or one's worth. It's not to make a, a pejorative statement. But the fact that you're constrained by a governance model uh, that is very public, um, you know, that comes with some benefits, but it also comes uh, with some costs in terms of the way that you have to operate your business. So... All of those things, I think, go into the go into the soup. But I would say, um, like any organization, this one does have unique advantages and disadvantages. It's even uh, several of us were talking about before coming in here. That's that's even differentiated uh, from your colleagues uh, down the street here in in uh, uh, in Sacramento. Um, that, was that would be one I would add, I think, is reputational. I think that, at least in my time, it seems like we have right. a and, very and, good reputation. Right. And so the question then is, that's, we have a good reputation. How do we build on it, right. and how do we continue to nurture it? And then that then becomes one of the, one of the developed advantages that, that you, you, can, you can have. And so, but, but part of that is saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to see that as a, as a comparative advantage. Uh, we see it as something that we're going to be able to exploit relative to our peers, perhaps. Um, how do we make sure that we're very intentional mm -hmm. uh, and deliberate right. about maintaining it? What's our strategy for maintaining it and continuing to, to build it? Um, so uh, Mark took a lot, a lot of the good ones there, but, um, but <laughs> I, I will uh, add one I think is very important, and, and that is um, Calster's reputation is of being outward looking. And I think uh, just Passe my comments just a few minutes ago. Uh, this is a um, increasingly important characteristic of an organization, which is one that is willing to, <coughs> as your um, executives have on two occasions in the last eight months, pick up stakes, come to Toronto, sit down, chat, and without a prefigured um, set of or prescript prescriptive um, agenda, but with a true willingness to reach out. I think this is unique, actually. Um, uh, I have, I've had a lot of experience with retirement systems uh, in the United States, and this is a unique advantage. I think, again, being intentional about that advantage is very important, but it is an important um, ingredient, in my view, of the kind of creative journey that an organization like this one, like teachers, like CPP, all have to, tr to, to go along. Uh, to ensure that you are always squeezing the most possible advantage out of your particular set of endowments uh, for the beneficiaries. Thanks. So we have a couple of people in the queue. Um, Ms. Yi. Thanks, Harry. I find this discussion really fascinating, and uh, thank you for, for being here. Um, I guess one of the constraints that we've always run into is um, the fact that we are operating under 
a fairly outdated civil service system. So we do have some impediments in terms of attracting uh, the human capital and talent, um, certainly here in Sacramento, but I think there are probably some ways to think about how to work around that creatively. Um, I was curious, this whole notion about um, comparative advantage. So could you kind of take that to the next level? Let's say each um, organization uh, defines that for themselves. So what would um, kind of peer and relational investing look like? I mean, if they're kind of coming at this with different definitions of their comparative advantage. Well, um, there's a lot of legal and other regulatory issues that I'm not going to get into. Right. The, the lawyers are much smarter than I am. But that I'm going to stay with the big picture yeah, on this. Um, the big picture is that uh, an organization that is, as I was just saying, outward looking and creative and reaching out and is interested in its peers and interested in the ways in which its peers are complementary um, is the absolute sine qua non of moving forward. The technical aspect, the one I'll allude to is that there is a need for a maturing large pension like Ontario teachers with a significant internal execution teams to carry out principal investments in private markets. Uh, we do need partners. We need a greater footprint um, to punch, say, ab above our weight, as they say. And having like-minded partners with a similar philosophy and a similar set of orientations is a critical piece of that. And one of those partners, I, I, I'd like to think, is an organization like Calister's that has a sophisticated team, maybe a little smaller, um, a, and a willingness and ability to engage and to be creative about whatever structures are required. I don't, wouldn't, wouldn't begin to wonder, but whatever needs to be done to create a, a, a real outcome from that complementarity is resident in both organizations. So um, I have a term um, that I, I use to describe this, which is coopetition. Um, and I think it, it's, there, there has to be a realization um, that coopetition uh, exists. Um, and so we had a very interesting dynamic um, in Toronto because we had the two big plans, the Ontario Teachers Plan and the Canada Pension Plan, literally sitting several subway stops apart. Um, and um, it was fascinating um, to watch the coopetition at play because we each had our own set of beneficiaries and we each had to act in the best interest of our, of our, of our beneficiaries, even though actually some of those individuals, every member of the Teachers Plan happened to be a member of the national pension plan as well, if you think about it. Um, but we, we had to think about the best interests of our beneficiaries. And so there were circumstances when we were competing against each other at fever pitch on one transaction. And at the same time, in the next boardroom, we'd be working together on another one. And so I think uh, mature organizations, be it corporations um, or public sector entities uh, need to understand that in today's world, uh, coopetition can exist and that you can be competing and cooperating at the same time if you have the requisite degree of transparency and openness with one another. And, 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 it, and, and so that, that, if you can figure that out, which is what Jonathan is suggesting, I think, uh, there's, there, there's where you sit at that nexus a, you know, with sort of one foot in the public sector and maybe a toe, uh, maybe more so over time in the private sector, um, you can use a coopetition in, in a very unique way. That, that, uh, those last uh, couple of comments, Mark, I think are probably uh, could encompass an entire day as to how challenging, uh, because if that was easy to do, everyone would be doing it. But it's so aspirational and inspiring to think about uh, what is necessary. Uh, and you use the term mature organizations. I think there's a level of personal maturity and security and a, a realization that there's a mutual self-interest of uh, where there's an alignment um, that we, I remember negotiating contracts at, at a very small scale with management, not nearly at the scale of this, but it was the same concept, was that we needed each other. 
And if we could find a way to get beyond the differences and cooperate with each other, we could all be better, better off. And I, I agree with you completely. And I, and I think it's increasingly going that way in the corporate world as well for organizations that get it. I think you see that in, in technology companies. Uh, you see that the difference in the change in the way people work. And I think you can see it, um, you know, go, going back to Ashby's, you know, first comments, you know, I'd like to think that the organization I work, I work for now um, has, has that mindset as we think about the relationship that we have with clients and we think about it much more as a partnership than sort of the traditional model, pay us a fee and we'll look after everything for you. Um, but I, so I think, I think, I think the corporate world needs to evolve that way. And I think, uh, uh, the public sector can do the same thing. And I, and I think there's, there's great examples in investing and elsewhere, uh, leading to better outcomes through that, that type of approach. Okay. Betty, did you have, uh, any other follow-up questions? No, that's fine. Mr. Juarez? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Um, you, you, the one thing that you mentioned that obviously caught my ear and I'll say, why being a public sector employee is the scope of uh, compensation. Uh, and I, mean, I, I guess I'll put it in the form of a question about in terms of the reaction that you get from the Canadian public relative to paying somebody a million dollars to work within a public environment. Because I, I just, I, I shudder to think the criticism that this board will receive, and maybe we can weather that, if we go to that model and assume that we're gonna pay on average somebody a million dollars. Um, and not only one person a million dollars, but a whole bunch of people a million dollars. And so I just would want your reaction to that and whether you think, given what you know about this environment, whether we could sustain that in moving forward. Right. So, so a couple things. Let me just um, first of all say, it all starts with transparency um, and explaining why. And so back to Ashby's comments or back to the example of the infrastructure example, here's the math. Um, are we better off building that internally or are we better off paying a third party to do it? Um, you might not like what it costs to hire those types of professionals, but that's what the market is. Uh, you know, should an investment professional, uh, is their contribution to society um, greater than a teacher's contribution to society? I, I don't know, probably not, frankly. Um, you know, I think the, the, the people who, uh, I have a, a, a grade six and a grade eight, uh, two sons in grade six and grade eight. Um, I think uh, what their teachers do is, is pretty important uh, in terms of, of outcomes uh, to individuals uh, and their success. Um, but the reality is, um, for whatever reason, um, th that's not the way the compensation is determined. So I think you just have to go out and explain it to people and say, here's the cost of doing it externally, here's the cost of doing it internally, that means we have to pay people more, and we're gonna be very transparent in terms of what we pay them, and we're not gonna hide it, and we're not gonna, gonna and we're gonna align that compensation, by the way, it's gonna be very outcome-oriented. Um, having said that, there is an amount, and in the Canadian context, it's probably a different amount uh, than in the California context, given, given history and, and experience. There is an amount that is unreasonable under any circumstances. And um, I, had a, I had a very simple measure, um, which is that no investment professional um, at the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board should earn more than a defenseman on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, that's, that sounds crazy. That sounds crazy. That sounds, that sounds crazy. But if, people, but, if people could get, but if people could get their head around the fact that you can pay two or three million dollars for a person to skate around with a stick, you can get probably your head around that you can pay them two or three million dollars to invest your pension. You can't get your head around that you're gonna pay them 20 million dollars to do that. Mm. So there is a limit. And so the way we thought about that limit is that our junior staff, we paid market. When I say market, that's Goldman Sachs market, McKinsey market, pick your favorite investment bank or bank market. As people became more senior in the, in the organization, those headline figures, we had to deal with those headline figures because was, everything was disclosed. And it was substantial, but it wasn't what the head of a private equity firm uh, would make. And to Jonathan's point, we were able to attract the type of people, like Jonathan, frankly, um, who were interested in finance, uh, maybe had made some money in their careers, but had an interest in, in, in the greater good or intellectually 
in doing the type of investing we were doing. So, so we, we, it wasn't just sort of back up the truck and pay people, you know, Wall Street or in our case, Bay Street salaries. We always had to have a level and a degree of reasonableness, but we got to the point that we could pay in the area code of what the private sector was paying. But not, was an un, it certainly was not unconstrained and the public quite rightly and our board um, and the uh, politicians uh, who had accountability for the fund um, certainly, you know, were sensitive as well. So it wasn't, it wasn't easy to get there. And it took 20 years, by the way, of conditioning to get people comfortable. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosensteel. Thank you. So this has been fascinating. Really enjoyed the conversation. Um, and a lot of the questions that I had are, are questions that have already been asked about um, our competitive <coughs> advantage and how to identify it, to, to nurture it, and things like that, uh, as well as who, who might our, our partners be. I, I, was, I was interested in reading Ashby's book that um, I think on this, this committee, when we've thought about partners, we've thought about, you know, gee, if, if, if CalPERS and CalSTRS and UC pooled all our money, we'd be, you know, six or seven hundred billion dollars and we would be huge. And only thinking about the, the benefits of partnership in terms of size, in terms of the fact that we could have a lot more money to put to work and we could be there for potentially more, um, more have more more authority in the in the market, but I think uh, Ashby's book talks a lot more about complementary skills and perspectives and talents that can be brought. And I think, you know, as we come away from this conversation, um, I think you know two two things definitely. One one is to think about the 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 advantages that we can cultivate. Um, being able to pay people well may not be one of those uh, anytime soon, and who and who we can best work with. But I think that's largely been covered to a tremendous amount already in this conversation. I'd like to go back to something that that Ashby mentioned earlier, and and you know it has to do with the fees that we're paying in traditional um, uh, arrangements right now, and uh, the idea that you know there. We, we know we're paying a lot of money. We're, we know we're making a, a lot of white men, even richer billionaires than they are already. Um, that's not what we're here to do. Um, but we've made the decision that, that that's the thing we should do because on balance it's better than all of our other alternatives and the net return we get from doing that justifies it. And so until we can develop the capabilities working with others, developing our own in, internal capability. Uh, as long as we're, we're going to continue to be operating in that kind of a structure, what can we do to improve um, our participation and our outcomes in the existing structure that we rely on primarily? Um, so great question, great series of questions. Yeah. Hi. Great series of questions, Paul. Um, in a weird way, in order to get the outcomes you want today, you kind of need to unwind a lot of history, where we have made choices over the decades to rely on external parties. And those external parties have used our fees to build up internal capabilities, which at a certain point, they begin to wield against us and make us feel like they actually are worth the fees that we're paying them. Um, Five times the cost is what Mark reflected on in their infrastructure example. Uh, that to me is a no-brainer. When I was consulting with AIMCO, our rule of thumb was 10 times the cost external to what it was internally. And so it's clearly cheaper. You get the same outcomes, the research shows. Um, but there's a political cost to the, I'm guessing, the people on this board to paying somebody at Calster's like they were a public sector football coach. Notice I say public sector football <laughs> coach. So I'm, I'm with Mark in picking the hockey player. We're not asking you to go and pay these people the 20 million the GPs are making every year. How about pick the highest paid football coaches for the University of California? 
and, and compensate according to that logic. Because I promise you a really amazing private equity professional will deliver that much profit to the state. Um, these are virtuous or vicious cycles. When you decide to outsource to a service provider, over time that authority and asymmetry emerges in the relationship where they can begin to charge you more. And so to push back against that, yes, there is a moment where you have to pay very high internal wages in order to begin to bring the entire sector and industry back into alignment. And I think working with peers is a really powerful way to do that. You can pull just another 30 seconds, then you can tell me where we'll I'm jump in. Um, <laughs> I think you can pool the resources and begin to get better alignment without having to do the, the football coach salary, the public sector football coach salary uh, in, the, in the context of a Calsters. And while I have the mic, I have a comparative advantage that I want to float for you, which is partner with UC and CalPERS to create a mentorship program for the next generation of technologists that want to work with you in Silicon Valley and are a two hour drive away, but literally have no clue how to work with you. So I, in the past year, I've met 50 of these companies that are like financial services in their mind as a venture capitalist. They don't know what you do. Every once in a while, so they see a news headline like the one four weeks ago that the state of Wisconsin spent $40 million on a single IT system, and they say, maybe that's a sector I should focus on. <laughs> but are you engaging with these startups? So I would say cultivating a new connection, not for investment purposes, but as a client. Because if the world is moving towards this tech model of institutional investment, why don't you get into the business of mentoring CEOs of tech companies that are going to improve your operations and partner with CalPERS and partner with UC, where we're already, by the way, doing this. We have seven companies in the UC doing a variety of different things. And give yourselves a leg up in the global marketplace for investment technology. And out of that, I promise you will emerge countless in interesting insights. And, yeah. So, so. Um, I think it's actually going to get a good perspective for this answer because I'm going to let Jonathan talk about how to partner with peers a little bit, uh, sort of maybe globally. You know, Ashby's talked about partnering with peers locally. I also think you have to change the way you think about the relationship that you have with your outsourced partners as well. And I think it goes back to rethinking what is meant by alignment of interest and rethinking what each party brings to the table. And in that regard, I think Calsters can bring a lot to the table and you need to become more creative in the way that you think about engaging uh, not just with peers, but also um, with asset managers uh, like the one that I work for for now. And I think a modern asset manager uh, in today's era is one that will see uh, the benefits that an organization like yours brings to the table not just capital, not just write us a check, um, but whether it's the intellectual input that comes with it, it's uh, the other reaches across asset classes, et cetera, et cetera, to build much something that looks much more like a partnership than a traditional outsourced relationship. And I think there's a lot of scope um, to do that today. You're doing it in parts of your business already. So uh, if you look at how you've approached real estate and some of the joint ventures you've created, you've looked at the way that you're creating some co-investment programs uh, within private equity, I would encourage you in the interim, um, as you build those capabilities, um, to continue to push to create true partnerships. Uh, Jonathan can talk about it in a peer organization. I'll talk about it with sort of you know, the traditional asset management firms. They are changing, and by the way, if they don't change, um, they're going to find yeah. that their business model doesn't work anymore either. So I can speak for the one I work for, that's, uh, but I, I, I don't think we are necessarily uh, unique, and you should be pushing um, what you've traditionally thought of as your external outsourced partners uh, or outsource relationships to be true partners because you'll deliver benefit too and you've got to look at it um, as a partnership 
coopetition type relationship, uh, even with Wall Streeters. I, I want to um, make a similar point, but a slightly different um, focus. Um, the it, it, the external manager um, is, like Mark was saying, is undergoing its own kind of revolution as well. And I say this as someone whose job it is to engage with our asset manager partners. And I would say that there is a great um, impetus among the more progressive of those, and, and I mean those who wish to be around for a long time, to really pair up. We see this. They want to pair up with large patient pools of capital because they know that that's actually how they're going to reduce their own risk. <clears throat> so one of the themes around um, relationships and <clears throat> partnerships of, uh, in, 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 at this particular juncture in history is when uncertainty goes up, we as human beings tend to get together. And it's, a, it's as natural as, um, the, the, as old as the, as the hills. And I think that's exactly what's happening. What's happening is that large funds realize that they need some certainty. And the certainty they need is that they need to know that there's going to be a constant flow of custom from a group of like groups that have the ability and the willingness to, have, to grow a longer term partnership. I think we see this all over the place. And I think that particularly as the, in the calculation of how value is um, uh, calculated for a private equity fund, where it's the price essentially times the volume, the price is in question. You know, how much can we really charge? And are our tax um, benefits always going to be there? Near miss in the last uh, go round. But the V is really important. And again, this goes back to comments we've made earlier about the scale. Scale is important, and scale can get you an admission to a real partnership, which some other funds that may not be as large or have the same um, stature may not be able to achieve. One last point, human capital. There are a lot of different skills that, were requi that are required, I think, to create truly effective long-term partnerships. There are skills to be able to um, extract the knowledge and the information that you require as you go along this journey. Those skills are not all technical financial skills. They're also what I call principal agent management skills. And these are skills that are found in all sorts of pockets of, uh, of uh, disciplines in, inside um, uh, uh, the university systems and in graduate schools. And I would say that you can find human capital to do this work that not, not necessarily needs to be remunerated at $2 million a year, but can make as much of a difference. Thanks. Ms. Vargas, and so, uh, if there's anyone else who wants to question, please get in the queue. Otherwise, um, after Nora speaks, I'll close up the uh, session and we'll move forward. So if you want to, please weigh in now. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. It's been very, very informative. I'm trying to find out, figure out a little bit more about the role of board members, because I think we have a specific role within our particular institutions and the work that we do in terms of policy and and um, and how we manage our assets, et cetera. But within the constraints that we have about, you know, not being able to meet together other than ceremonial maybe gatherings where we would meet with another institution, what other opportunities would there be? So it's not just these informal settings where we go to a conference and get to know other board members, but really to strategically align ourselves and really think about sort of our bigger impact because of scope, because of, of, our, um, of where we fit in into the big, bigger um, financial um, arena. I'm trying to better understand where do we fit in at, in that world? Because I don't know that even in, in having conversations about the alignment and bringing other, other folks um, and getting other folks involved, it really isn't there isn't a lot of discussions happening between board members of the different institutions to come up with strategic visions about what is it that we want for our teachers, because the teachers in Canada want the same things that our teachers want, which is a return on our investment. But there has to be a way, and I'm not really sure that I know what that is, and so I'm trying to figure out if you could give some insight into that. 
Uh, it's, an, it's an interesting point. I, I think that we, um, we have tried at, at Ontario Teachers to engage our board members in a, in a manner that gives them the insight into the challenges that we face without pulling them into the details and the technical um, features, which really doesn't suit the purpose of, of, that, of that relationship between management and the governors. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that um, I think you, your comments put on the table is how do we, um, how do we increase the scope of, of our board members' understanding of our efforts to develop relationships that go beyond the level of management, mm -hmm. but also to the level of governors. And um, I welcome the idea, actually. Uh, had never thought of it, to be honest, but I welcome the idea. We, we often take our board members with us to um, visit uh, some of the countries where we're involved. We, we were there in one recently. We will take them on, on uh, what we call Atlantis trips, which is finding you know, um, uh, new and interesting geographies to invest in. But actually, there's probably as much of a purpose in having them understand the diversity of perspectives that come from governors and other jurisdictions that may well inform them as much as we hope to inform you. So I think that's a very good idea. I'd like to follow up on that. Um, fantastic idea. We don't have it. The best that we have is board education, which is you being lectured to. What we need is uh, board innovation meetings where you can sit with other boards and think about innovative operating models. The board's job is to resource the organization for success. And you will obviously have constraints in the context of the legislation and contracts, but your job is to resource this organization for success. And so what we need is a, in a safe place where you can talk with other board members from other organizations. Um, and maybe we can catch up offline and, and actually brainstorm that, how we might do that. I uh, shared this with Jack and Chris, I think Dana and Sharon recently. I had the uh, opportunity to spend a week in, of six days in Hong Kong, and I thought I appreciated Asia. Being on the ground, unbelievable, life-changing. You could feel the future. You could see it. Can't, you can read about it, but when you see it and you feel it, it's, it's, it's a game changer. Uh, Ms. Yamamoto? Wow. Thank you very much. I, I, um, I really didn't think about all of this and you know, being a new, a new member on the board. I agree with, with Nora that, you know, where do I fit in? Where do I fit in? I, you know, I read your book, took notes, talking about the col collaborative model. Where does Kelsters fit in that process? How do we, um, um, how can we adapt to the current market changes? And the, the, the phrase that you used, alignment of interest, really stuck out because that's one of our agenda items later on in, during this board meeting. And um, so I wanted, it talk, your book talks a lot about the relationship between the various entities. So can you a little, elaborate a little bit on um, the forms that that may take with our, with our um, joint ventures, our investors, our managers, and then, um, Lastly, I really enjoyed your last chapter where you talk about the remediation, intermediation, and all the key ingredients to that, um, trust, transparency, and the alignment of interest. So that really stuck out to me. So just a little bit more about how to build those relationships. I know that in talking to our investment <laughs> staff that we, um, because we're long-term investors, we are able to have a relationship long-term, develop it, and accordingly negotiate fees. And that's, we talked a lot about, you talked a lot about that today and about how when you negotiate fees, it's because you've built relationships along the way and so your fees can be reduced. But I really don't know really what that means. We negotiate fees from a higher level. The, the, the um, investor part of us wants to start at a lower level right, and go up, just like, just like some businesses want to start at the higher level and then just kind of come, come in between. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think 
your job in this is to empower the staff to think creative thoughts about how they access the underlying assets they need. This re-intermediation implies innovation. We can't just go to the biggest GPs in the world and beg for a mandate and they're going to give us the fees we right. want. They have too many people begging for that same mandate to give you an aligned deal. So re-intermediation implies new platform companies, it implies new JVs, it implies partnering with peers, um, and the ultimate objective is indeed alignment. So this week, I think it's going to be announced, but the Alaska Permanent Fund, um, RailPen, and Wafra are going to launch a brand new seeding platform for private equity with a billion dollars. And so they're going to go out and put, in a single year, six new GPs in business. That whole project is innovative, and it is incredibly hard for the staff, and I've been advising them, to get it across the finish line through the boards of their respective organizations. So from the outside looking in, I say, oh my gosh, a seating platform backed with these huge pools of capital, they're going to be able to negotiate incredible fee structures, and they're pulling name brand individuals out of name brand GPs and getting aligned structures. And yet, when it comes to the board, it's hard. And so I think what I encourage you, if you're asking me what is your role, have an open mind and um, empower some of the staff to put their own careers on the line because I think they're willing to do it and go do something creative uh, because that is the core of this re-intermediation argument, which is let's do some innovation in the way we access markets in order to get a better deal for our members. Um, my, my big focus is mutual dependence. So your partners should depend on you as much as you depend on them. And that's a very rare thing these days. If you go through your entire book of partners, do they need you? Are you important to them? And, uh, and, that, and that's the core of alignment. Empower the team to make bigger bets with a fewer number of people. Anything, anything else? Shall confidence. Nope. Okay. I have confidence. Um, well, I, I allowed this to uh, go a little longer than expected, um, but that's a good thing. This was a rich conversation. Um, so I'll just summarize some points that I um, <clears throat> think are worth closing out on. Um, we as a committee obviously are policy driven body. So characteristics of I think effective positive, uh, effective policy bodies are their forward thinking, they're open minded as Ashby just said, they're curious about what their policies say today, how they worked in the past, and how they need to be changed going forward. Be forward thinking, curious, open-minded, to deal with as we're trying to wrestle with this larger issue, the realm of what is possible at CalSTRS. Be create the CalSTRS model. Chris and his team did a great job bringing you know, the public equity portfolio in-house, getting the same type of returns or better at a lower cost, so it's a no-brainer. Private assets can be more complicated. But what is possible? Um, what are our competitive advantages? Some of which I think are straight, straightforward. We know what they are. There are others that have been surfaced today. I think for as a committee, working with our staff and our consultants, maybe some time flushing out what some of those other competitive advantages are, and then how do we exploit them? Mm -hmm. um, find where possible, the collaboration with like-minded organizations, whether they're here or elsewhere, same values, different needs, um, the ability to work in a collaborative uh, co-opetition, to find that sweet spot of co-opetition. Um, and potentially, ideally, should we actually amend what we've been doing a little bit or a lot, it took 20 years, it takes us five, 10, or 20 years, we can look back and assess, had we not done anything, what would the cost have been? Having made some changes and tweaks along the way, were we able to get the same types of returns or better at a lower cost? So ultimately, the teachers of the state of this system will be the beneficiaries of that. So that's our challenge, I think. Um, I want to thank everyone for their comments today, for my colleagues' questions. I think it was very thought-provoking. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sure. Good. Good. We'll, we'll take um, 
Why don't we take it's a... Out there, just oh, lunch is out there? It's behind is, are people, Should we do lunch? Lunch? Okay, we'll, 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 we'll take lunch uh, till uh, 12.45. We'll come back at 12.45. <laughs> Thanks.